Hey everyone, today we're talking about the looming trade war. Because I paid market price for a degree in economics, so I might as well use it once. As you can imagine, most people are of the mindset that having more imports than exports is bad. Although, there are a few people who disagree. And surprisingly enough, they're not all Chinese. So today we're going to pit these two ideas against each other in a debate where I will take both sides. Kind of like an intellectual schizophrenic. The topics will be debt, GDP, and jobs. Alright, so let's start with the debt. The one thing that successfully shut down the American government. And yes, I'm even including the time the British burned down the White House. Some people argue that debt and trade go hand in hand. For many, many years, the United States has suffered through massive trade deficits. That's why we have $20 trillion in debt. Alright, so that can be interpreted more ways than the text from my girlfriend saying, I'm fine. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into what he was really thinking at the time. But the prevailing theory was that he was talking about trade's influence on foreign direct investment. Now, bear with me because despite the fact that foreign direct investment might be the most yawn inducing collection of words since Roth IRA, this is actually pretty interesting. According to Investopedia, a website that thinks normal encyclopedias are for the cool kids, in trade, the balance of payments must always net out to zero. Well, it doesn't always have to net out to zero, just look at turn of the century Britain. Ooh, I love your diamonds. I'll tell you what, I'll trade you a feather from our majestic crow for them. In recent times, it's gotten a little more under control though. So what does this mean? Well, basically it means that, and I'll explain why in a second, if you import more than you export, you'll get more foreign investment. And if you export more than you import, you will have less investment. Just look at this graph comparing capital inflow to the trade deficit in the United States. Now, if you can't see a pattern there, you need to get your eyes checked out. So why is that? Well, according to Milton Friedman, this leads to deficit nations experiencing a greater degree of foreign direct investment and foreign ownership of government debt. I mean, hot tip for all you stockbrokers out there, I heard that Razor Phones hasn't sold a product in years, so bye bye bye. Now, for the 1% of you whose minds have not melted yet, let me start to explain what's really going on here. Because if this was simple, well, then an army of economists wouldn't hit the street every time Trump suggests a trade policy. So first of all, international trade deficits don't, in themselves, create debt. When I go to the supermarket and buy a lime, I don't owe anybody any money, and that wouldn't change if the supermarket was in Mexico. What did happen though is an American, not the government, just me, gave some of America's currency to another country and gained a lime. Alright, so how does that turn into a foreign direct investment? Because it's not as though the guy just turned around and used the quarter I gave him to buy an American bond. Again, we're going to work through all this, but interestingly enough, on the large scale, there is never a trade surplus or deficit for any country once you factor in the trade of financial assets. Which, alright great, I'm sure someone's getting rich off of this, but I'm pretty sure it's not me. So why is it a 1 to 1 ratio? I mean that's pretty specific. Well, The internet is a buzz with explanations, although I might be the first one to try to tackle it in less than an entire tree's worth of pages. Basically when you buy something, currency leaves your country. So if you consistently buy more than you sell, well then you're going to run out of money. I know it feels like I'm about to hit you with a plot twist designed to make you feel stupid, but no, you're just going to run out of money. So how does the US not lose cash after running a trade deficit that's older than I am? Well, it's because we're also selling stocks, real estate, and debt internationally, and we don't track that in our standard trade measurements. So here comes the part where I was pulling my hair out. How is it a 1 to 1 ratio amongst every country across the globe? Is there a deeper story or have global traders just been trolling us? Well, unsurprisingly, there isn't a cabal of global traders wasting trillions on messing with economists. Instead, for all accounting purposes, countries try to keep neither a loss or a gain of foreign currencies. 
So the Federal Reserve either gains or pays money based on gained or lost money on all transactions to balance everything out. Don't worry, this is confusing, so I'll give you a few examples. In the US, we sell a few billion dollars more in intangible goods like stocks and bonds, so our Federal Reserve actually gains money. Unfortunately, if you look at a country like Egypt, who, much like my high school quarterback, peaked a long time ago and won't stop talking about it, you see that you have a huge trade deficit in assets that are about as desirable as a Minion sequel. Which leads to… Egypt is taking urgent action to avoid a currency crisis and prevent a messy devaluation. After appealing to people to go easy on exchanging the local pound for US dollars, the central bank is holding auctions to control currency movements. It says foreign reserves have fallen to a minimum and critical level. Figures show they've plunged to the equivalent of barely 11 billion euros, covering only three months of imports. Yes, if you can't sell off stocks, debt or property, you're footing the bill for making sure that there's still money in the economy. And as you can imagine, if your country literally doesn't have cash of any sort, well, then you're not going to have a good time. Alright, so now that we have a basic idea for how all of that works, we can look at all sorts of arguments. So let's look at the big one. GDP changes, because this is where things start to get interesting. Although interesting is definitely relative in this case, as some of you might find this a great substitute for Ambien. Alright, so check out this graph, because this is really weird, and probably the opposite of what everybody expects. The red line is GDP growth, and the green line is growth in the trade deficit. Now I'm not sticking my flag in Mount Crazy and declaring this true. But what this would indicate is that a rise in the trade deficit would lead to a rise in GDP growth. This should be setting off all sorts of alarm bells, because if you're going to say something like that, you best have better than a graph with a similar line to make your argument. My first thought was, maybe this is GDP growth leading imports. You know, you just got that new promotion. You deserve that new made in China finger trap. And the great thing about economics is that maybe there's something to that. Although why wouldn't you buy a made in America finger trap like a damn patriot? Well, the leading theory on why a trade deficit and GDP growth can coexist is that the service industry makes up the vast majority of modern day US economies. And unless you want to export our stockbrokers overseas, something that I'm sure most Americans would be fine with. This stuff just can't be exported. Again, the most widely accepted theory for this is that an increase in advances in intellectual property and service industry jobs drives higher consumption. Because what am I going to do with all this cash? Buy bonds and stocks? What do I look like? My grandfather looking for birthday gifts? Now, because we don't actually manufacture much anymore and we have a negative savings rates, we buy imports. As you can imagine, this is not a universal rule, because if you're a country that's dependent on making things, but you're importing more than you're exporting, well, then either someone's getting money somehow to buy all this, maybe a few donations from people who don't like paying taxes, or a service industry that, well, it's not therapy, but it's paid by the hour one-on-one -on -one sessions. Either that or your GDP is shrinking along with your exports. Alright, so now let's talk about trade and employment, because this is the problem that Trump is aiming to solve with tariffs. The Trump administration out in force today uh, touting the job creation benefits of proposed tariffs on steel and aluminum. President Trump's top trade advisor says the plan will revive an industry neglected and frankly in crisis. You can try to fight an uphill battle with the invisible hand by working with companies to make them manufacture things in America. But the invisible hand has the tendency to give poor people the finger. You could try to encourage more innovation to create American products that people internationally want. But guess what? They're not going to manufacture them here. You could try to abolish the minimum wage and make automation illegal to make factory life competitively terrible for those manufacturing intense countries. Or you could use tariffs to so drastically raise the price of goods that companies are indifferent between producing abroad and producing here. Oh, I forgot. 
You could also let the free market take its course, like many conservatives are arguing, and continue to be a service and innovation based economy, rather than manufacturing based economy. So as you can probably imagine, this is where the fight really begins. First, let's look at what Trump has to say. The word is reciprocal. That's the word I want everyone to remember. We want reciprocal, mirror. Some people call it a mirror tariff or a mirror tax. Just use the word reciprocal. If they charge us, we charge them the same thing. Well, unfortunately, it seems as though we forgot the word reciprocal when we were reporting this, despite the fact that Trump might have said it more times than the word the in that speech. We are going to impose reciprocal tariffs on countries that have higher tariffs than us. Sounds like about as radical an idea as breathing to stay alive. And oh, it just so happens that countries that have higher tariffs also are countries that have economies based on manufacturing. Because no doy, if you're a country that doesn't manufacture products but instead focuses on providing services and innovation, why on earth would you want to make the products in your country more expensive for your people? Besides giving your citizens a sense of pride and accomplishment. That said, there is a reasonable argument that could be made that this is increasing the number of manufacturing jobs in America. Although that sector currently represents less than 10% of our economy. And well, small government advocates, you might want to grab your stress balls really quickly because the US federal government actually employs almost twice as many people as American manufacturing. Look at that manufacturing employment line. It's falling faster than Facebook stock prices. And that it's been falling since the late 60s. But it really took a hit in 2000. Now this led to well, a person I wouldn't expect to agree with Trump on trade to agree with Trump on trade. The issues that are gaining us support in the Midwest, for example, is the disastrous trade policies that have cost this country millions of decent paying jobs. I'm talking about NAFTA permanent normal trade relations with China and many others. And what workers in the Midwest and in fact all over this country are demanding is that we have a trade policy in which corporate America starts investing in this country and not just in China and other low wage countries. All right, so this is not exactly the same. Mandate America great again isn't as catchy a slogan, but the sentiment is there. The real problem is that neglecting a dying manufacturing sector disproportionately affects the rural areas and disproportionately benefits cities. Dale living in Kansas might not be able to get a job at Amazon or invent the cure for cancer, but I'm sure he can put two pieces of a toy together on an assembly line all day. One other huge problem with the manufacturing sector in America today is throngs of Ford workers once assembled cars like the Model T, much of the work done by hand by muscle power. Competitive pressures prompted industrial companies of all kinds to seek more efficient, less labor intensive and cheaper ways to make products. Bad news for millions of workers like Holly Stover who once held jobs in industrial companies. Even if we can bring back manufacturing, there's no guarantee we can bring back manufacturing jobs. Turns out manufacturing might be manufacturing's worst enemy. That said, again, for rural communities, some might make the argument that anything helps. That said, one main reason people oppose the new Trump tariffs is, take it away, Fox News? This is what doesn't make sense about the president's uh, trade policy. Uh, he wants to preserve jobs in the steel industry, which is highly automated. By doing tariffs on that industry, you raise the price of steel that hurts other industries like the, cre like the, the creation of Caterpillar's various products that hurt manufacturing jobs. Now that might sound really specific, because it is. I haven't cared about Caterpillar since I forgot everything about metamorphosis a few hours after learning about it. But that small calamity is representative of a bigger problem of people not wanting to buy expensive things. Which means that when you raise prices, people buy less. And when you have people buying less, well, as you can imagine, that creates some problems for a lot of people. First, it messes with the bread and butter of our modern economy, the service industry. 
For example, Trump's new solar energy tariffs. President Trump's new 30% tariff on imported solar panels. A move he says designed to help American manufacturers getting crushed by inexpensive imports. Sounds great. Why didn't we do that years ago? Well... But the Solar Energy Industries Association says it will hurt consumers with higher prices and could cost 23,000 workers their jobs this year. Yeah, having your costs spike 30% isn't great for business. But don't worry, it did help American manufacturing with two major winners. US-based solar manufacturers Suniva and Solar World. Great, alright, I like the sound of that. Oh jeez, of course there's a catch. Suniva is majority owned by Hong Kong-based Shunfeng Industry Clean Energy, and Solar World is the US arm of Germany's Solar World AG. Even stranger, Jinko Solar, a Shanghai-based company, said in a statement Monday that its board of directors has given the go-ahead to finalize planning for the construction of an advanced solar manufacturing facility in the US. What the heck is happening? You're telling me China is opening up a factory in America? What did they do, run out of space? It's happening though, but why? Well, the factory will employ 200 workers and more robots than a Terminator movie. They're actually doing the labor intensive part in China, a country that has a minimum wage of 87 cents per hour. But don't worry, because we're charging a 30% tariff, so that should even everything out. Anyways, they're making the core components that require laborers in China and bringing them over to America tariff free, and assembling them using machines in US factories. That said, I'm not going to poo poo 200 jobs. That's like not bending over to pick up a penny. On the flip side though, when you factor in the estimated 23,000 jobs lost because of installers losing work, solar companies shutting down, and manufacturers cutting back production, all connected to a new lack of demand. Those 200 jobs seem a little more like walking into oncoming traffic to pick up that penny. Especially when you consider that they will never be used for exports only supplying the protected US markets. So there you have it. These tariffs aren't good for US companies, the US service industry, and US consumers. But they have the potential to be okay for US manufacturing. And that industry is pretty important to more rural communities. So how do you benefit? Well, that's really the debate. For now though, if you want to benefit the service industry, remember to subscribe to my channel and like my Facebook page. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of That's All I Have To Say About That, click here. And please click here to subscribe. And remember to like below. And if you're really a fan, you join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.